Hey everybody, um, our best guess is this is week 11. <laughs> We're all old people here, so <laughs> our memories aren't what they used to be. Um, last time we talked about step one and uh, past involvement in the occult and how to pray against that stuff, right? It feels, it's been two weeks. We didn't meet last week because the church had a business meeting over Sunday school hour. So um, if you would turn, those that are here, to step two, <coughs> love to cover step two and three today, if not two, three, and four. Um, let me say this. Um, they asked me for a topic for next time, next class, which in their mind starts in January. Uh, so that gives us, what, three more classes? We don't, we don't miss any class over the, over the holiday, apparently. So the, the class we were going to miss, we missed at the beginning of the month. So um, I'd like to finish this up by the end of the month. And then we're going to roll into a topical study of different women of the Bible. Okay? Let's change it up. I hate to leave prophecy. I hate to leave all that stuff. Um, but I'm just going to throw a little switch in there. Who knows how I may be able to weave in current events. <laughs> um, but if you have a particular lady you are fond of or interested in, just let me know because I'm going to be constructing it as I go. I'm not working off of anybody else's book. So, okay. Um, all right, step two. Of all the steps... You got to look at the steps of freedom as tools in your quiver, arrows in your quiver. You don't put tools in a quiver. Tools in your toolbox, arrows in your quiver. I think I just mixed my metaphor. Anyway, <laughs> um, these are things that you're going to go back to as you need them in the midst of the battle. So it's really important to be fairly well acquainted. I have the luxury, since I teach this stuff all the time, to have. A, a number of these, not all of them, but a number of these prayers pretty well memorized, okay, because I just need to. Um, step two is the one I go to the most often in my own walk with the Lord because the enemy is a liar. He's a deceiver. He has three, remember, he has three main strategies, temptation, accusation, and deception. Well, deception kind of weaves its way through each thing, you know, um, Temptation, Robin, stop at the pretzel shop and get, it's Friday, it's a great deal. You can get 12 pretz off pretzels for f seven bucks. Great deal. Okay, it's a great deal. There's truth in that, right? So I stop and I get a dozen and I have one. Then the enemy's like, they're fresh. They're the best when they're fresh. Have another one. I don't need to eat another one. I shouldn't have eaten the first one. I shouldn't have bought them. Okay? And no, this did not happen recently. I stay away from the Philly Soft Pretzel place. But anyway, so I ate the second one. Oh, come on. They're just so good. One more. Do you see how he does? Okay? Now, each, in each case, he's lied to me that that pretzel will satisfy me. No, it won't. It'll taste good at the moment. It all tastes good at the moment. It's very tasty in my world, in my mind. Yummy. Okay. But it's only going to leave me wanting what? Why would I be susceptible to the second? Because it leaves me wanting more. It doesn't satisfy. This is true for all addictions. Because like the carbs in that, trigger the joy center, which is right behind your right eye, small part of the brain. It, it's pseudo joy. Who's the one true source of joy? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. You know, he tells us at his right hand, are ple uh, in his presence is the fullness of joy. At his right hand is, is pleasure forever. He is the true source of joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Okay. Joy is that inner state of contentment, of satisfaction, of wellness, of well-being. And my circumstances can't touch it if I'm really focused on Christ. So I can have joy in the midst of sorrow. 
I can go to a funeral for a believing friend, have the joy of knowing I'll see them again, but still be crying because I have a temporary separation. Okay? You know? So, when I look to food, which obviously is a struggle at times from cheesecake, as we were having this, I figure it's just me mastering the craft, you know? Uh, but, you know, a che cheesecake doesn't satisfy. It tastes good at the moment. I don't eat big. Piece. I don't eat mold pieces. Blech. That would be too much cheesecake. But, um, you know, people with cocaine, same thing. Mm -hmm. It stimulates the joy center behind the brain. Um, sex, arousal, orgasm stimulates the same section of the brain. And so people continue to, they get, I gotta have more, I gotta have more, I gotta have more. Why? Because they don't have the true source of joy. Mm -hmm. And that's where addictions come from, in, in essence, in what's going on in the brain. The addictions also stem from hurting so much that you want to numb out. Okay, I'm not dealing with stuff in my hidden chambers that's, that's painful, so I've got to take something to stimulate the joy center and to numb me out so that I don't feel anything. So a, I don't want to minimize addictions to, to be that simple, simple, but it is certainly an element in it. Okay. Another lie that the enemy loves to do, he, he, he really is very good at um, caramel coating onions. Yeah. Okay. And, and convincing us that they're caramel coated apples. And you don't realize how nasty they are until you bite in. And then you realize, oh my word, this is not what I thought. Now fried onions, when they're caramelized in the pan, they taste pretty good. But it, when you're expecting juicy apple that's caramel... And you get the onion, that's not good. Okay, but it's already infected your system. Now, this prayer is a really good detoxification for that. Okay, um, one of Satan's favorite lies. In fact, I probably would have to put it at the top. Is for a believer to think, I'm worthless. I'm worthless. I'm no good to anybody. I'm no good to God. I'm worthless. Why would that appeal to him so much? Because it puts you out of the front lines. It'll make you sit. Um, yeah, you, you will become inactive. That's a cause. But intrinsically, why does he like that lie so much? It is a direct insult. Oh, yeah. That's true. It's a direct insult to the blood of the lamb. Yeah. You guys know the MasterCard commercials, right? <clears throat> You know, such and such is 10 bucks, such and such is 50 bucks. Time together is what? Price, priceless. You know, a thing's value, um, I often will use this illustration. Um, I've never understood people who collect baseball cards. I'm a sports fan, you guys know that, but I'm not a memorabilia collector, um, especially baseball cards. Um, my day, you put them between the bicycle spokes. I'm sitting here shaking my head because mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite. <laughs> okay. Ever since you told me it. Yeah. Best. Well, I mean, there's this dude. He wasn't even handsome. That's a girl's perspective. Um, Honus Wagner. And he's in the Hall of Fame. And he dates to the early days of, of baseball. And there were a, a limited number of his cards made. It was my understanding of somehow linked to tobacco or something, some sort of vice mm -hmm. that he had come to faith in the Lord and didn't want any connection with. So um, he didn't want his cards associated with the product that they were being sold with. That's my understanding. Could be wrong. Anyway, limited number of Honus Wagner cards. And I mean, there, there have been people who've paid six figures for these cards, maybe even seven, okay? I mean, there was a nun not long ago who got given um, a Honus Wagner cart, mint condition, and it was valued in, I think there was six or seven figures. You know, it was a donation, and she had to sell it or whatever, I forget how much it sold for. That card can do nothing. It shouldn't do anything. It should sit in plastic in a locked box in a safety deposit place. It should do nothing. Now, what gives that card its value? 
There's only one thing that gives that card its value. What is it? Desire. If somebody was willing to pay money for it and they put a price on it. They said, I want to buy that card. Okay? I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't give you 50 cents for it. Okay? But somebody was willing to put a price on that. Now, the Lord Jesus was offered up as a price for us. Papa, Father God, decided we were worth it to Him to redeem us, to buy us back. A penalty price had to be paid for sin. And that price was the blood, of the, shed, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when a Christian buys into the lie, I'm worthless, what are they doing? <laughs> They're saying the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has no value. Mm -hmm. Satan loves that because it's such an insult. Now the Christian doesn't think I'm insulting Jesus, but Satan knows that that's what's going on. So that's why he pushes that one so hard. He pushes another one, feelings determine truth. No, they don't. Yeah. God's Word does. You know, so those two go hand in hand. Um, oh, there's just so many I can't even begin. To, I'm giving you a list in, in um, the next page over. There's a sample list. When people are going through step two, I usually encourage them to go through and check off the ones that, you know, resonate with them. Um, and then I have them, um, uh, there's a two pages to the list. And, and the second page is not a full page, so I have them extend the line further down and, and we're, go through that opening prayer and ask the Lord to show you. you. can You don't even have to go through that big prayer. You can just simply say, Lord, show me the lies I've believed. And you start writing them down on the left column. And then you ask the Lord, I need you to speak truth to those lies. And then you'll start writing stuff down or you'll call me and say, I need help. You know, and we'll be directing you to verses that show you what the truth is. You know, um, but the way the the free the freedom prayer goes is, Lord, I confess I believe the lie that I'm worthless. So you're announcing, you're declaring the lie, and sometimes just speaking it out loud robs it of its power. When it's in your head, rolling around in your head, for some reason, it has much more capacity to snooker you. When you state it out loud, you're, you're processing it in more than one way and you're able to see, well, that's not true. That's silly. Why was I thinking that? But you pray through, you announce the lie, and then you renounce it, and then you declare truth, and then you reclaim. So the process goes very simply. Lord, I confess I believe the lie, that I'm worthless. I renounce that lie because the truth is I have infinite value through the shed blood of the Lamb. And Lord, I ask you to reclaim the ground I gave to the enemy through believing that lie. And you say that prayer for every single one that you would check off on the list or add to it. Okay? And you will find a lot of relief. Now, there's also in, in this pack, in this step, excuse me, um, a doctrinal affirmation. Okay? And it's really helpful to read that out loud. You know, um, because you're declaring truth. The, the way to spot the lie. People who, who have to work as a bank teller, um, one of my board members was here. She used to work at a bank. She would tell you that they do the training, not with giving you uh, counterfeit money. They, give you, they make you handle the real thing so well, so often, that when they slip the counterfeit bill in, they spot it. Because it doesn't feel right, doesn't look right, because they know the truth so well. So one of the major everyday battles, or everyday tactics that we need to use is to be in the Word of God, to be under good teaching, to study, to not just settle for people feeding us, but really purposing in our hearts to learn to feed ourselves using inductive Bible study method, you know, good uh, exegetical things that we learn to, you know, understand the meaning of the text and an application to our lives. All right, any questions on step two?
We're going to jump to step four because I can cover that one fairly quickly. Um, we will come back to step three because that's a bit more intensive. Step four is rebellion versus submission. And in this step, what we're looking for is any overt or subtle ways that we've given to a mindset of rebellion. You know, that um, in Exodus, is it Exodus? No, well, Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, 15, somewhere around there, 15. This is when Saul, um, he offers a sacrifice before Samuel gets there, and or he doesn't do something. You know what? He, it's, it's, he doesn't carry out God's, here's what it was. He doesn't carry out God's command in the battle to kill everything like he was supposed to. And... You know, he comes to, he meets up with Samuel, and he says, hey, everything went well, and then what is the bleeding of the sheep that I hear? Oh, we brought the best things to offer to your God, not my God, our God, but your God. And then um, Saul, uh, Samuel's response to him was that, you know, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and, it, and insubordination is as, as iniquity and idolatry in the heart. When we rebel against God, when we know what we're supposed to do and we don't do it, we do something else. We, we, we know that this is the path we should take, but this is the path I'm going to take. Who are we acting like? Yeah. And in essence, that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I want to do. Insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Insubordination is saying no to a direct order. Iniquity is choosing to do what you want to do. Okay, iniquity is, is not just missing the mark. You know what you're supposed to do, but you're choosing to do something else. Idolatry, more shifting something else, the God of self most of the time. Sometimes it is as extreme as the God called Lucifer. Okay, the, oh, here's a potential rabbit trail. Uh, the deep state. Another name for the Illuminati. Another name for the, anyway, Committee of 300, Committee of 13, whatever it is. Um, their religion is Luciferianism. They want to unite the world under Luciferianism. Because they bought into the lie that Lucifer is the brother of Jesus and the misunderstood one, one for so long, he's the good guy. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, you know, he he led Adam and Eve into sin, iniquity, rebellion, transgression, whatever you want to call it. Um, so where do we give in to the enemy in this way? Well, sometimes we do overtly <laughs> sin, okay, and we transgress, you know. And so in this in this um, step, you're giving the initial prayer, and then you're giving categories at the bottom where they're the typical way that the um, rebellion will manifest, typical areas, excuse me, where rebellion will manifest, where you want to do what you want to do when you want to do it, and you don't want to do it God's way, you want to do it your way, you know. Um, the only time that we are permitted in the Bible to go against civil authority and civil government is if, it's trans if it itself is violating God's commands. Okay, um, I know for me, when I went through this, it wasn't necessarily overt sins. It was an attitude that I had to deal with um, where I was grumbling and complaining. That's another area where the Lord might put you to task, where I was doing what I was supposed to do, but I had a really bad attitude. Okay, I had a rebellious attitude while I was outwardly doing what I was supposed to do. I was really... Not, I didn't have a good attitude. I was grumbling, I was complaining, I was moaning and groaning. I didn't want to do it, but I was doing it anyway. So it's just a really bad attitude. So the Lord checked me on that one. So don't forget about attitude checks. Okay, so on the next page you have a prayer where you'll be saying, Lord, I confess I've been rebellious against the civil government by speeding. <clears throat> yeah, I had to do that one just about every day. Um, <laughs> Lord, I renounce speeding. I ask you to reclaim the ground I gave to the enemy through 
you know. We all do it. I, that's why, that, yeah, you don't. <laughs> um, I just picked the most common one, honestly, people can relate to. So, um, and that's, that's again where you want to allow the Lord to examine your heart because it can go a lot different ways than just overt actions. It can be a mindset and attitude. No, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't want anybody telling me otherwise. Now that's pride. It's going to roll into part from step five, but it's also, I know God wants me to do it this way, but you know, and then I can rationalize. There's so many different ways. So many of our young people today are rationalizing it in their relationships. You know, I don't go any further than that, but it, it can happen that <laughs> All way. All right, so we're going to wrap up there. Um, so we did two and four. We'll go back and do we're probably just going to wind up on on three because three is forgiveness. So if I have next week, I don't have a calendar in front of me. Let me pray and then we'll figure it out. Father, I just thank you for the victory that is ours. Thank you that when we know truth, it sets us free, free from the deception, free from the bondage that the enemy tries to provoke in our lives. And I just thank you uh, for the power of your truth. And um, I also thank you that submitting to you, walking with you, walking uprightly before you is a far better bath than rebellion. And so, Lord, I pray that you show each of us any areas where we've even had an attitude that needs to be adjusted. Um, but, Lord, I pray over the week that we be seeing these areas where the enemy has ground and we'd be quick to pray and, and get that ground back for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.